Well, let's start this morning with another very difficult round of Sunday headlines for the government focused on sexual misconduct and the judgment of the Prime Minister. We're now joined by the Work and Pension Secretary, Therese Coffey. Thank you very much for being uh, with us. Good morning. I don't need to remind you, of course, you know, Chris Pinchers resigned, had the whip suspended over these allegations uh, that he groped uh, two men at the Carlton Club on Wednesday night. In today's newspapers, there are multiple other allegations about his behaviour stretching back years. Were you aware of these concerns around the behaviour of Mr Pincher before this week? Well, I think, first of all, it's important to uh, set out that, of course, serious allegations were made. They were dealt with decisively. Not only did uh, 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 the previous day that, that Chris had already resigned as Deputy Chief Whip, uh, but when people came forward and made those formal complaints, uh, appropriately, they're now going to be investigated. And it was right then uh, for the Chief Whip, uh, with the agreement of the Prime Minister, to suspend the whip. But, um, you know, I've been uh, in Parliament the same length of time as Chris Pincher. I don't pretend to be part of the general chatter rumour mill uh, discussions. I know Chris hasn't been... A, I don't believe he's been in a long-term relationship, uh, but that's about as far as my knowledge goes. So, just to be crystal clear, before this week, were you aware of any allegations or concerns over the behaviour of Chris Pincher? No, I wasn't. As I say, I'm just not part of that sort of... Uh, kind of chatter group, as it were. Um, and, I mean, to uh, be fair, to be fair, it's not a chatter group, is it? This guy, the last time he was in the Whip's office, he had to resign. He actually referred himself to the police after some accusations. It's not just Westminster chatter. There were serious concerns about the behaviour of this man. Well, Sophie, um, as you say, he pointed out, um, I think an allegation was made from prior to when uh, Chris Pincher had been an MP, um, and there was an investigation uh, that was... Uh, Chris was cleared at the time and he rejoined the government at that time. So, obviously, that was in the public domain. But, um, uh, as I say, these allegations have been made and it's really important that when uh, such behaviour, it's uh, when people are concerned about this, instead of just different elements, that they come forward and make those complaints, you know, to the police if necessary. Uh, and uh, I'm pleased that the, this investigation is now underway. It's been dealt with uh, seriously. Uh, and meanwhile, the government will continue to get on with delivering uh, priorities uh, as it's trying to do in a variety of ways. OK. Um, you say you weren't aware of any uh, allegations around him. I just want to talk about what the Prime Minister knew and when. Um, because Boris Johnson, of course, made Chris Pincher the Deputy Whip uh, in February. When he was given that job, was the Prime Minister aware of any allegations about his behaviour? Well, I don't know about any individual conversations. Um, um, it's uh, been suggested that uh, there was uh, a discussion, a referral to PET, uh, which is, happens with all ministerial appointments, actually, that uh, there's an element of a bit of vetting that goes on. Uh, but ultimately, the decision is that of the Prime Minister. Uh, I'm clear that, uh, as I say, I'm not part of those individual conversations. Um, it, Chris had served in government before and uh, was uh, had been a minister elsewhere, so I'm not aware that there was anything that was brought to the attention of the Prime Minister uh, to make that change. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm still not really clear. Um, you say you weren't aware of any reports. Uh, you say that everyone is passed on for vetting if they, you know, become... Uh, are given a position. W was the Prime Minister aware of allegations around Chris Pincher's behaviour when he was made Deputy Chief Whip in February? Well, I've just said to you, I'm not involved in any of those uh, direct conversations. Well, why don't, uh, but why don't you ask? I just, I don't... You know, I, I, I get, you know, perhaps it's easier just to be able to come on uh, these programmes and say, look, I don't know, so who knows? But, but, but surely well, you uh, must I, ask to try and find out. You know, that's the first thing that most people would do. When do, did the Prime Minister know? So that when I am asked this question, I can give the answer. Well, as I've just outlined to you what um, has been suggested in terms of uh, things were referred... Uh, but nevertheless, uh, when somebody phoned the Prime Minister, uh, particularly on Friday, I think it was, um, he agreed with the Chief Whip that these, uh, whip should, uh, the Whip should be suspended. Sorry, I, don't, so I, don't, I, I, I genuinely don't understand that sentence, that um, it was suggested and things were referred. I, I don't, w what does that mean? Well, I think it's been well laid out, um, Sophie, that uh, uh, when the appointment for becoming Deputy Chief Whip again, um, moving from a different ministerial post... Uh, it was uh, vet went through vetting process like normal. Um, but as I say, I'm not directly involved in those discussions. Um, I'm not going to try and do so, and I'm not part of that more general uh, kind of rumour speculation mill within Westminster. Uh, but nevertheless... Sorry, um, I'm just going to come in again. I'm take. just going to come in again. Ap apologies. Um, you don't you need to apologise. Well I'm out. just going to give you the same answer, Sophie. But I don't, I don't understand the answer. Uh, uh, forgive me. You say it was well laid out. 
that he went through a vetting process like normal. But the question is, were, was the Prime Minister aware of allegations about his behaviour? I'm, I'm not aware that he was made aware of like specific claims about uh, um, any particular incidents or anything like that. No, I'm not. I don't believe he was aware. That's what I've been told today. Um, but uh, that's... Uh, uh, you were asking more about more general rumours, and I, I've no idea what conversations have been had. I'm just no, I am aware that he, the prime minister, was not aware of specific claims that had been made. And as I say, when okay. ultimately he resigned, uh, Chris resigned the whip, uh, sorry, resigned as deputy chief whip. And then when specific things were brought directly to the attention of the prime minister, he agreed with the chief whip uh, to suspend the whip. Okay, so you say that, as far as you know, the prime minister was not made aware of specific claims in 2017, because I feel that's quite important. If you just look at what's in the papers today, Sunday Mirror, the front page, the Prime Minister was warned twice of concerns on the Deputy Chief Whip. Mail on Sunday, the Prime Minister knew all about uh, groping Tory two years ago. The Sunday Telegraph, the PM turned a blind eye to the sex pest warnings. They say that Craig Whitaker actually resigned from the Whip's office because of the Prime Minister's decision to appoint Chris Pincher. We know, of course, uh, Dominic Cummings tweeted this week to say, if the PM didn't know about Pincher, as he's claiming, why did he repeatedly refer to him laughingly in number 10 as Pincher by name, Pincher by nature, long before appointing him? Do you really believe the Prime Minister was not aware of any specific allegations? Um, I've just suggested or said I don't think the PM was aware of specific claims, no. It was news to me in the mor this morning to read the reason given why Craig Witter resigned from government. Uh, and I have no idea what Dominic uh, Cummings uh, tweets on anything, so uh, I don't follow his uh, Twitter handle. OK. OK. Um, there's been a bit of a shifting position from number 10, uh, which we're trying to kind of grapple with. Um, initially, we said the Prime Minister didn't know. Now, number 10 seemed to be saying that some allegations were raised at the time that he got the job in February's reshuffle, but the quote is, in the absence of any formal complaint, it was not appropriate to stop the appointment on the basis of unsubstantiated allegations. Do you believe that's the correct position, that it was the right thing just to give him the job, even despite uh, the fact that there were these unsubstantiated allegations? I think the Prime Minister made the choice he thought was best uh, for the interests of uh, the parliamentary party. Um, we've been through an interesting, and uh, sorry, the government, in order to help get government business through. Uh, Chris had been a minister for some time in different departments and uh, went back into the whip's office. Uh, as I say, the, uh, there's a number of um, activities we are trying to get on with um, in, in terms of government and getting legislation through the House uh, as, so we can get on and deliver people's priorities. Um, that's the sort of thing that we're doing uh, right now. We've just passed a, uh, an act of Parliament in order to make sure we can make cost of living payments to okay. people. So it's, it's, there are a variety of ways of, or reasons why somebody will be asked to fulfil a particular role. I just want to ask you, Personally, you know, because uh, we know, obviously, uh, that victims of sexual misconduct, <coughs> of sexual assault, can be very reluctant to make formal complaints, particularly if there's a power imbalance, obviously. Um, given that there were these unsubstantiated allegations, do you think that it was right for Chris Pincher to be appointed to that important job in February? Well, what I think is right is that people should have the confidence to come forward, whether they want to do that through the um, ICGS, which has been set out... It's not what I asked. ..to take I, this I, approach. Obviously, I well, agree I'm with the finish my... It's not the question that I asked. Well, I'm explaining that I think it's important that people should have the confidence to follow the procedures that have been put in place deliberately because of uh, situations like this. Uh, I'm very... wish people would go to the police more with allegations uh, if they feel... Uh, that a crime has been committed. Uh, but importantly, I think that, uh, we, uh, as I said earlier, I'm not prone to, uh, privy to the exact conversations that went on. I have been told the PM was not made aware of specific claims. Uh, and indeed, there's an aspect of a vetting process that every ministerial appointment goes through, but ultimately it's the decision of the Prime Minister. And I believe he made that in good faith. You know, I can't help but thinking that a lot of people listen to this will be feeling, frankly, that you're dancing on the head of the pin by saying specific allegations. That it, he was aware of general concerns, but because you're going to say specific allegations, do you think you can just wriggle out of it? It's not a case of that. I've said at the very beginning, Sophie, I'm not party to conversations that the Prime Minister has on, on this topic or indeed many other topics. Uh, all I know is uh, that uh, alleg ser once serious allegations have been made, uh, the effective action has been taken. Is the real problem here that the fact is that the standards of this government are set by the Prime Minister? 
How can he rigidly enforce them if he himself has broken the law in office? We know, uh, of course, that he's been investigated on everything from how he refurbished his flat to whether or not he lied to Parliament or misled Parliament. To top that off, his ethics uh, chief has just, uh, just resigned. He's not even going to bother replacing him. Is the real issue the fact that the standards of this government are set from the top? Well, what I see from the Prime Minister is the leadership that he's showing, one, tackling issues in this country, uh, whether that's the priority of uh, trying to level up across the country. I also see his leadership in the world. He's just spent the week uh, particularly uh, with Commonwealth, but also with uh, the G7 and NATO. So this, this and kind of thing again, doesn't matter then? Is that what you're what, saying? Because what of I'm the saying other work is you're doing, leadership, you know, standards don't matter. What I'm saying is the leadership qualities of the Prime Minister are very evident. I think on other matters, uh, of course, uh, the, it's the Privileged Committee that will be uh, considering uh, the investigation about whether the Prime Minister knowingly misled Parliament. Uh, okay. And indeed, for this situation involving Chris Pincher, that now needs okay. to go through its formal process. Uh, so it's uh, important that those uh, issues and those processes are followed. Uh, and indeed, uh, I'm not quite sure okay. when the committee gets underway, but they will be soon. Um, I want to talk a bit about the wider culture in Westminster now. Uh, in the last year, this has happened five times. Chris Pincher, Imran Khan, Bob Roberts, David Warburton, Neil Parrish, <coughs> all Conservative MPs who have resigned or have been suspended for allegations of sexual misconduct. I mean, there are 271 male Conservative MPs. In the last year alone, five of them have been suspended. That is an incredible ratio. Is there a specific problem with Conservative men? I don't think that's the case at all, Sophie. Um, I don't know the situation, the scenarios elsewhere. Um, one MP, uh, well, no longer an MP, Imran Khan, has been convicted of an, an, something that happened before he became a member of parliament. Uh, and other investigations are underway. So I'm not going to comment on individual investigations because its process needs to be followed. I understand that, and I'm not asking you to do that. Um, Let's, let's, you know, because it does feel, frankly, that, you know, we, we're sitting in studios in every regular, regularly, we, we're talking about the culture in Westminster, we're talking about these kind of misconduct allegations. And what I'm interested in now is what do you think should happen? There are six bars in the Commons and the Lords, there are 30 in the parliamentary estate. Is it time to seriously talk about closing Parliament's bars? Well, I think um, in terms of Parliament's bars, we have a particular sort of Working hours, uh, we have particular... And a lot of these situations that you're referring to, I don't think happened in the bars. So um, that's a, a matter, I guess, for discussion within Parliament. But we've already reduced the number of um, uh, drinking and uh, eating outlets uh, within Parliament. Uh, but importantly, what does matter in terms of culture is actually being a government and a Parliament that gets on and delivers uh, um, the priorities of the people. OK, and that's so, what so I will continue to do, and that's what it, I see it sounds like for the majority not, of people. It sounds like you're not uh, seriously looking at closing Parliament's bars. Um, how about reform of working practices? The speakers talked, for example, about MPs no longer directly employing staff, so it's easier for them to make HR complaints. Andrew Ledson's talked about maybe having a proper HR system for Parliament. Is that something that can change? Well, an HR system for Parliament has been introduced, so I'm not quite sure what the background to that is. It's always been the case that uh, MPs had parliamentary support in terms of the fact that they are employers. Uh, but there is a separate process now where people can get advice and but, indeed... But do you think anything uh, should change around working practices? staff belong to a trade union as well. Do you think anything else should change around working, you know, the working structure in Parliament? Well, I think that <clears throat> we have a Parliament uh, in Westminster. We sit for more hours than anywhere else in the world. We have two chambers of the debate. So it's very busy with the select committees, with all sorts of uh, other activities that go on. So there is a, certainly um, a huge amount of time um, spent, understandably, uh, so no change. debating no, no, important no, issues. So no, no specific changes, then, <coughs> you don't think? I'm not aware of specific leaders. changes. I think it's important that MPs continue to employ the people who work for them. Uh, I think that relationship is really is okay. absolutely critical. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, as I say, over the past few years, new processes have been introduced uh, in terms of that. But meanwhile, most of the staff, most of the MPs are just getting on, doing their absolute job of representing constituents or indeed uh, scrutinising legislation. And that's, as I say, why we are working on things like the cost of living challenge, uh, also elements, you know, trying to help people in their daily lives. This summer, a lot of people, perhaps not so confident of the weather of the British, uh, of Britain, are trying to get abroad. And again, we're taking decisive action, reducing that. I, I will talk to you about that in a minute, but 
it just a con it just sounds like you know you, you, there's no change that you think is necessary. Even though the Sunday Times is reporting 56 MPs apparently being investigated for sexual misconduct, five Conservative MPs had to resign in the last year alone. No change. I, I just want to ask you, uh, you know, a personal question because because I get that it's it's a difficult position that you're in this morning. Uh, I, I understand that. Um, you know, how's it been um, to have been you know like a woman in the Conservative Party listening? over the last couple of years, to some of these allegations that have been made, victims speaking out, often anonymously, because they feel that they can't do so on the record, that the reputation of Parliament is, is so low, and it does really feel, doesn't it, as if there's so many concerns about the behaviour of MPs. How does it feel for you as well, an MP? I think there are more women MPs in Parliament than ever before. And um, I can assure you, if uh, people approach me, I would do the, my best, although, uh, dare I say it, uh, going to the ICGS is the best way for people to uh, lodge, a, uh, lodge complaints right. in order to tackle that. You know, we have to be professional. There are different situations that happen where people have been unprofessional and unpleasant, and that needs to be tackled, absolutely. I'm very much in favour of firm uh, make, uh, dealing with these things firmly, uh, and Although I think in this latest the... situation, that oh, is no. what has happened. Uh, but uh, you know, we need to continue to try and encourage people to come forward uh, and, as I say, go to the police uh, if they believe that a crime has been committed. Nobody in that regard should be feeling that they've got some protection. They haven't. We need to continue to try and make sure we have the highest standards of behaviour, especially in the Palace of Westminster. OK, there you go. Um... <clears throat> But we do need to move on to talk about some other uh, subjects now. Um, there's chaos at the airports. You mentioned it earlier. Holidays being ruined thanks to cancelled flights, uh, the fact that there is a staffing crisis. Um, the government's fast-tracking security checks for new airport bag handlers to try and improve things. What's the idea and are there any security <coughs> concerns around this? Well, certainly uh, airports um, and uh, other airlines released a lot of people um, after the furlough scheme had come to an end, perhaps not anticipating the uh, desire for people to get out of the country. Uh, that's why we've been running job fairs in places like Gatwick Airport in order to get people into that work. I think it's really um, the, the government has responded. We've Reduce the amount of time in order to uh, do various checks. I think counter-terrorism is now down to 10 days, so we've prioritised that, recognising the pressures on airlines this summer. Uh, but also, um, I know Grant Shapps, the Transport Secretary, had already made some changes so people could start training in less secure parts of the airport rather than waiting for the full checks. So together, we have been uh, putting forward our approach in order to help the airlines. But what it really matters that when airlines offer flights that they have confidence these can be delivered uh, and indeed making sure that their passengers know well in advance whether or not their flight's going to be honoured, not making cancellations at the last minute. Uh, of course, uh, I'm very keen for people to stay in this country and spend a lot of money in the UK, uh, but I understand that it's important that they have a system that uh, they have confidence in and rightly they'll get compensation if flights are uh, suddenly cancelled. OK. Um, it, it, we're in a slightly strange position, aren't we, where it's almost like the jobs market is a bit too hot. You have very low unemployment levels, but a record level of vacancies, 1.3 million. Now, the business minister, Paul Scully, uh, tells Sky News recently that effectively people who want to should work longer hours to try and ease this. He said there are a record number of vacancies. There are also people who have recalibrated what they want to do when they're on furlough. We want to make sure that those people that are not necessarily working full time through universal credit, we can get them back into work to be more productive. Do you agree well, with him that perhaps people recalibrated what they wanted to do during the pandemic and actually it may be a good time to try and boost their hours? Well, I think that's a fair um, a kind of top-level analysis. Certainly when people were put on furlough, others, uh, they started looking for other types of jobs. Um, they re sort of different work-life balance. And I think there is something here about employers thinking about the flexibility they can offer, about whether everything has to be a 12 shift starting at 4 a.m. or whatever it is. Um, uh, so to try and make that uh, more attractive to people to come and do that job again, certainly in terms of people on benefits and out of work, in the last five months, we've got over half a million people into work through our Way to Work campaign. That's a real achievement. We've had some record highs of getting people to work in the last few months. Uh, and we will continue to do that. Uh, but it's important that we try and get people to progress in work as well. Um, but we'll uh, keep trying to match those vacancies. And that, as I say, we're, at the moment, we're having a job, monthly jobs fair in Gatwick Airport to try and bridge that gap. 
OK, and then just very finally, uh, because we are almost out of time, um, Boris Johnson's election pledge to build 40 new hospitals by 2030 is now facing a review by the government spending watchdog. They're looking into uh, value for money review, uh, whether the hospitals will in fact be new. It was such a big part of the election campaign, wasn't it? I remember that pledge really well. It's not a great look, is it? Well, off the top of my head, I'm trying to remember the numbers. I think we've already done six. I think there are five in progress um, and, and underway. And this is a you know, reasonably long-term project. The NAO is the is actually Parliament's um, uh, an organisation of Parliament, and it's up to them to uh, work with uh, the Public Accounts Committee to decide what elements they want to investigate in terms of the use of taxpayers' money. So it's uh, we are getting on with that job. Uh, and I know many communities around the country are really appreciating the additional facilities, the rebuilt facilities, as well as the brand new facilities, uh, in order to make sure that they have 21st century healthcare available to uh, treat them as patients. OK, thank you very much for being on the programme this morning. Teresa Coffey there uh, for the government.